All righty. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, for those of you in the audience here today, I'll just uh, let you know we are live streaming now on, uh, on the internet on our, our YouTube channel. And uh, to all those of you who are tuning in uh, via the web, welcome. So uh, we have a, a very special situation this afternoon. Uh, what you would typically see here in the, the hot shop uh, amphitheater is traditional furnace style glass blowing, where we might be using a big furnace with molten glass, very large ovens to, to heat and soften the glass. But uh, today we have a very special visiting artist. Now this is David Sandage, who has come to, to visit with us from Claremont, Florida. And uh, the type of glass working that David specializes in is what's known as flame working. So rather than using a, a big oven as a heat source, we use a torch that runs on propane and oxygen. Uh, and as he cranks those gases up as high as they can go, we can get the, the temperature of the flame up around 4,000 Fahrenheit. That's probably about the range he's in right now. And uh, David is going to be making a dragon for us today. Now to make the, the full piece, may take him four to five hours. He did all of his prep work this morning. Uh, he already got a head start this afternoon. We, we had him start around one o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we've got one of the wings finished, which is sort of hiding out under a piece of fiber frax on our, our table here, a little bit of insulative material to, to let that wing cool slowly or slower than it would in the open air and uh, that'll allow him to make another wing that matches that one as he gets into making the second one. And he is well into the body of the dragon at this point. So this is sort of the, the core of the body he's got going here. Uh, you notice he's holding the piece with a clear glass rod and uh, the end of the piece that that's attached to, that's where the head will go. So uh, that clear the clear rod is attached right to the end of the neck and we're getting some of the, the spikes put on to the back of our dragon here. And he's got a bunch of different colors in here. Uh, in the wing that he prepared earlier, uh, sort of the webbing of the wing is a nice transparent bluish green. Uh, the body of the dragon here has sort of a, a grayish blue or maybe a, a bluish gray. And we'll also have some purple highlights to it as he continues to work. Uh, he's adding a lot of details from some black colored glass. All those spikes will be black. And it looks like we're going to add a little detail onto the, the tip of the tail here, or around the tail. So David has been working glass for 40 years now. Uh, he actually got his start thanks to uh, his brother who worked for a, a factory known as Glass Baron down in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, when David was just 15, his, his brother brought him into the factory. He was immediately uh, enamored with the, the possibilities of glass and sort of the, this amazing process that we use to make glass through. And so he has been cranking along ever since the age of 15. And uh, after several years working for Glass Baron, he was actually recruited by a company called Arebus Brothers. And uh, most people who might be familiar with Arebus Brothers uh, would know them from their, their shops in the Disney parks that are all around the world. And David was recruited because he is a brilliant glass maker. And uh, he was brought in and eventually ended up managing their, their shop of glass makers. Uh, did quite a, a lot of the, the higher end commission work and awards for different uh, corporate situations uh, within Disney. Uh, he developed loads of different product lines, trained staff, and now he has gone back out on his own as an independent artist and sells the majority of his work through fine art fairs uh, around the state of Florida and also back up in Virginia. So David keeps incredibly busy. He's got a studio at home where he makes his work and uh, gets out on the road many weekends throughout the year to then uh, retail his work in, uh, in different fine art shows. And I actually first met David when I worked down at Disney, uh, sort of in between stints here at the Corning Museum of Glass. 
and I was amazed. He is a brilliant flame worker, uh, one of the best in the world, particularly with the, the solid sculptural work. And it's a real treat to be able to have him up here in Corning for a few days. So there are a, a number of different processes we can potentially use to shape a piece of glass. Uh, we have processes we use when the glass is room temperature. We could cut it, carve it, engrave on it. All right, looks like David's done with the, the core of the body for the moment. He's loading this into an oven that is holding at about 1,050 Fahrenheit right now. That will be hot enough to keep the glass happy. So uh, we don't want to get it too cool too quickly or the glass would crack. He's going to need to come back to that piece to attach all the other parts to it. If we don't keep that section warm, when he tries to come back and heat into it and attach those other parts, it's very likely the core of the body would crack. So we're going to keep that warm in the oven. And now he can start to, looks like he's going to work on the next wing and get it to match that first one. So I was mentioning different processes we use for glass making. Uh, there are processes we use, uh, as I mentioned, when the glass is just room temperature, we can cut it, carve it, engrave on it, sandblast, acid etch uh, the surface. Yes? Aha, uh -huh. we have a question from the, the interwebs there. What kind of torch is this? Uh, this is a Carlisle CC bench burner. Pretty... Uh, sort of the industry standard for, for many, many decades of, of torches. Yeah, so some other processes we use for glass making. Uh, we might take thin sheets of glass or small chunks of glass. We could layer them into a pattern, set that in an oven, heat the oven up so the glass will melt and fuse together. Uh, we could take that process a step further. If you get the oven a little hotter for a little longer, the glass could then slump. So it could take on the, the shape of a, a low open face mold. Uh, the mold process can be taken even further. We could build a, a full three-dimensional mold and fill it with chunks of cold glass and heat that up so the glass melts and takes on all the details of the mold. We have machine processes to make some, some fairly basic forms in glass. And then there are a couple of processes we use where we really get the glass screaming hot, get it really molten and fluid, and essentially shape it by hand. And uh, flame working is, is one of those couple of processes. The other would be furnace style glass blowing. And uh, all these different processes have different benefits and different challenges to them. The biggest benefit to flame working is how we can focus the heat just where we need it. So it lends itself really well to making very fine details. So David can aim the heat just where he wants to affect the shape a little bit. He can keep the heat away from areas where that extra heat might start to destroy other details. So it really gives us a, a lot of control over finer detail. Now, uh, probably the biggest challenge to flame working would be scale or volume in particular. Making very large, heavy objects on the torch is a really difficult thing to do. Uh, there are people who do make very large, heavy objects on the torch, but uh, there, there are certain limitations to that. And there are other processes that might tend to make larger, uh, heavier work a, a bit more manageable. But again, the, the biggest advantage to flame working is how we can focus that heat just where we need it, and it's great for fine details. So David's got actually three different colored glasses going on here. He has sort of the, the first color that was built into a little bit of a curve, uh, sort of the foundation for the wing, and that's where it'll actually attach to the body. And he builds off of that. He's got a, a transparent bluish green, and uh, so that'll be sort of for the webbing of the wings. And then he's using a black glass for sort of the bony structure in between the, the webbings there. And glass is colored by adding different metal oxides in with the batch of clear glass ingredients. So all sorts of different combinations of oxides will give us the different colors. And he'll continue to sort of build out this wing in stages. So he's got a little more of this bluish green that he's going to add. And I've, 
I, I know I'm not alone in this, but I've certainly admired David's dragons and particularly the wings for, for years now. And it's a, a nice treat to get to see how he builds these up. There's a, a lot of problem solving in glass making. And uh, you always have to be thinking several steps ahead to, to get the sort of detail you're after. Uh, if you start the piece in the wrong order, you might start melting off other details as you're trying to create new ones. And uh, just sort of seeing somebody's process and how they build an object like this can, uh, can really inform your own uh, artistic practice. So great to have David here. Great to, to get a, a chance to see him work. And uh, hopefully those of you on the web are enjoying this unique opportunity as well. It's uh, not often we get a chance to see David Sandage make his work these days. So this is a great opportunity. And for those of you out there in the, the Glass Art Society community, uh, David also will be a demonstrating artist at the Glass Art Society conference in St. Petersburg, Florida uh, in a couple of months. So you can look forward to that and hopefully search out his demo for those of you on the web there. So you notice David sort of cleaning off the, the tips of those colored glass rods every once in a while. Uh, it's almost like cleaning, the, cleaning off your paint brushes as you're about to move to the, the next step. And one particular thing with nipping off the, the tip of this rod here, he just picked up a fresh rod of colored glass. The end of that rod had been snapped apart. And anytime you heat into a broken edge of glass with a torch, it wants to boil and bubble. So by stripping off the end that was broken, he gets to glass that is not going to boil and bubble so easily. So that's why we sort of trim off that end, make sure he's working with nice, clean glass so we don't incorporate any, any sort of scum or any unwanted bubbles into the sculpture itself. So another question from the, the web there, is that a miniature marver that he keeps rolling those rods on? It absolutely is. Uh, it is uh, a little torch top graphite marver. We use a, a lot of graphite in glass working. It's a, a really handy material for a, a glass worker. It accepts the heat really well. And no matter how hot the graphite gets, it will never stick to the hot glass. Most other materials, as they heat up, they do stick to hot glass. Uh, as you can imagine, getting your tools stuck to what you're working on while you're working on it, not the best thing. So yeah, graphite is a, a really handy material for us with glass. Uh, we use it to make molds. Uh, we use it as a work surface. And David can use that, uh, that graphite surface to shape the glass and also to control temperature. Uh, that graphite is going to suck the heat out of the glass quickly. So if we want the glass to stiffen up quickly, we can use that for a quick cooling effect. And it's very important that all these parts are fused together cleanly. Uh, he's going to be really uh, creating quite a composition here. There's a lot of parts that get attached to make this entire dragon. Each step of the way, if the seams where parts come together aren't smoothed in cleanly and the glass hasn't flowed together properly, as the glass cools, it will crack in those areas. So you're going to notice as he attaches things, he will often go back into the flame, really get the glass close to the head of the torch, and really try to cook in and fuse those gaps where the different parts are coming together. So glass making is really all about temperature and timing. And uh, David makes this look really easy, makes everything seem like it just happens very smoothly. Well, that comes with 40 years of experience. You get that much tighter with your temperatures and your timing. He knows exactly what the glass wants to, needs to look like to, to be able to flow and move a certain way. 
Uh -huh. so, uh, folks on the web are wondering if uh, the rods he's working with are hollow or solid. These are all solid, so all solid rods. This is going to be a completely solid sculpture. So the core of the body is solid, and you know, all, the, all the, the wing details are solid as well. I know David has made some dragons with some hollow bodies to them, but uh, this one will be solid. Uh, so another big trick with a, an object like this, he needs to get the wings to match, right? Uh, you can see it's a, it's a pretty sort of organic bit of forming that goes on here. It takes a lot of experience and a really astute eye to be able to get every step of this wing to match the previous one there. And if they don't match, it's pretty obvious. So yeah, he's uh, quite dialed in to, to making this sort of an object. I know David has made thousands of dragons through the, the course of his career. What uh, chemical compounds are making that really pretty smoky color that we're seeing here? Uh, what, I think the question is, what are the colorants in the glass? Um, I am not perfectly certain. Uh, this is sort of a transparent blue-green here. My sense is that there's some cobalt oxide and probably some iron oxide in there. I'm not 100% on that. But uh, yeah, we typically will get blues from cobalt oxide or silver oxide. We can get uh, sort of an aquamarine blue from uh, black copper oxide. We can also get a green from copper oxide, from black copper oxide, and we can get green from chromium as well. So it's some combination of those colorants would, would be my guess. See how this is coming together. It very much l starts looking like a wing very quickly. And if any of you guys have any questions at all, by all means, throw your hand in the air. We'll, we'll get them answered. Yes, sir. What's that? Yeah. How does this flame working affect the eyes as you're, you're staring into the flame for, for hours? Well, we are wearing glasses that do have a bit of a filter to them. Uh, there is a, a little bit of UV and infrared that's coming off of here, but for the most part, the glasses we're wearing filter out the orange that you're seeing when he puts the glass in the flame. That's sodium burning off of the glass. We call that soda flare. And honestly, your eyes get a little tired after working a long day, but my, my eyes after an eight hour day on the torch aren't any more sore than they would be with an eight hour day reading or on the computer. It's, uh, yeah, not, not really all that much different. Yeah, the, the filtering helps quite a bit. And for, uh, for the amount of time you folks will be in here, it is no risk looking at this flame with, uh, without this, uh, this protection here. Long term use, yeah, if, if you're working this style of work every day, We've got the glasses on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got one I'm not sure if you can answer or not, but so uh, somebody was saying that this looks a lot like plastic pieces that they have. Do glass workers ever work in plastic? Aha. Uh -huh. So a question from the web that this looks similar to some plastic sculptures that somebody has seen. And do glass workers ever work in plastic? Uh, well, my understanding, I don't think you could work plastic quite this way. I don't know that you would want to. I'm guessing there'd be a lot of fumes coming off of it. But I do know a couple of glass workers who have created molds off of glasswork that they've made that they have then cast plastic of those objects. Or uh, I do know of a couple of glass workers who had some sort of rubberized masks made from models of their work as well. So. I, I know some folks who have designed, who are glass makers who have designed some things that have wound up in plastic, but I, I don't know specifically of 
people sculpting plastic themselves, quite, uh, quite the way we see this going on here. So again, building up the, the second wing for our dragon, the core of the body, we're keeping warm in our annealing oven at the, the end of the room here. It's holding that piece at about uh, 1,075 Fahrenheit. And that's hot enough to keep the glass from cracking. We don't want it to cool too quickly or it would crack, but it's not hot enough to soften the glass. This glass won't start to soften until it's up around 1448 Fahrenheit. So uh, it is plenty safe in that oven. It just sort of keeps the glass happy and it'll allow uh, David to bring the rest of that sculpture out and, and make all his attachments without having to worry about things cracking as he goes. like they're starting to match up pretty well. Surprise, surprise. Look like they're matching up pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I mentioned David got started in uh, flame working on, because of the, the influence of his brother and his brother being a, a flame worker. Well, David's wife is also a, a flame worker. She makes uh, some fantastic beadwork and small scale sculpture and some, some fantastic jewelry. And who else in your family is a, a glass worker? So my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law. Uh-huh. And, and also, two wow, and also David's sister is a glass worker, his brother-in-law, and the brother-in-law's two sisters. Are, are also glass workers. So uh, a whole lot of glass in that blood. And uh, that used to be a, a pretty common thing amongst glass workers, uh, especially sort of earlier 20th century in the, the US. It used to be very difficult to find information on how to do this stuff. Uh, and most of this sort of flame working uh, craft was handed down through generations of family who had teach it from generation to generation. And uh, it was hard to get somebody to teach you this stuff. Nowadays, the information is all over the place. It's all over the internet. There are schools all around the world where you can learn this sort of thing. But uh, that really didn't become the case until uh, probably the 90s or so when people started to open up a little bit more uh, with information on flame working. And I actually was speaking with uh, uh, a flame working artist earlier who was a little bit older than myself and he mentioned when he was, was first trying to learn he uh, used to go down to the mall to watch a, a gentleman flame work and eventually the gentleman started to recognize him and realized he was coming back more and more to watch and to learn so every time he would step up to watch this guy the guy would shut off his torch cover it up and walk away People were not very forthcoming with information, so it was important to, to be a, a family member of fellow glass workers to be able to learn this. Aha, so another question from the web. If David typically works larger or smaller, uh, the answer to that would be yes. He works all over the place. <laughs> he makes large objects look incredibly simple. He does make some, some smaller scale sculptural work, everything in between. And uh, we were, we've been talking over the last couple of days. Uh, I mentioned David is selling uh, the majority of his work at uh, fine art shows nowadays on the road. And uh, he mentioned that uh, where he makes the, the, the most consistent money is off of smaller scale sculpture, which you can imagine, it's uh, easier to sell some smaller objects. And then uh, he really prefers to make some of the bigger objects that are a, a little more true to where his heart's at. And he is incredibly skilled at large scale solid sculpture on the torch. But yeah, it's, uh, to make a living as a glass artist, you gotta work in all sorts of 
different scale and, and different price points for your work. So it's important to work both large and small. Aha, uh -huh. another question for the web. Does David teach classes? Um, he does not teach very much at the moment. Uh, for many years, he was working for a couple different companies where he was, his teaching really was limited to training staff at those companies. But now that he's been out on his own uh, doing the independent artist thing a little bit more over the last few years, he is thinking about starting to do some more teaching. So uh, we would love to get him in here at Corning at some point. That would be fabulous. And uh, we, we do expect to see David on the, the teaching circuit soon. He has a, a wealth of knowledge to be shared. Uh, I, I've been working for 22 years myself and, and working here at the museum for uh, let's see, since 01, so another 18 years around the museum, and I still learn a ton from uh, watching David work and, and discussing things with him. He's just a huge wealth of knowledge. He's seen it all and done it all. And glassworking is uh, certainly one of those crafts where your, your cumulative knowledge and experience really shows. And uh, I've, I've been working glass 23 years myself, and you feel like after 10 years, you've really got it. And then you get to 15 years, and you realize, I didn't really know that much at 10 years. And then you get to 20 years, and like, yeah, 15 years, I was OK. And now I know a lot more. And then I've run into friends of mine who are saying, oh, yeah, well, once you get to 30 years, then we can talk. It's, it's really just this huge accumulation of, of knowledge and experience that, that moves you forward. And uh, uh, David's 40 years of experience and the, the sort of experience he has of so many different, uh, hundreds if not thousands of different types of objects that he's made through his career. It's just a, a huge depth of knowledge. Yep. Okay. Another another question for the web. Can he stop working and then start up again? Uh, he can. Now there are certain risks in that. Uh, we don't want to let the glass cool completely and then quickly stick it back in the flame, or it would crack. But if we keep the glass warm, like he is actually doing as he works his way through this piece, uh, we could keep pieces warm in an oven for a while, and he could come back to them a few hours later. Uh, we could let the elements completely cool down, warm them back up slowly in an oven the next day or a week later, and continue on the piece. But it, it's really important to have the right temperatures in the right spots at the right times as you're working. So it's probably a bit easier for him to continue through the entire wing rather than stopping after doing just a couple of segments of the wing. Uh, this way he knows exactly where the heat is. The heat's sort of moving in one direction throughout the piece. He's sort of building a, a gradient of temperature from cooler to hotter. And the glass really appreciates that, that sort of a gradient in temperature. Uh, when you have extreme differences in temperature throughout a, a glass piece, that's when it's really likely to crack. So, uh, yeah, we, we technically we could work this piece over the course of a year and just make a part here, a part there, warm them all up in an oven to make all the final attachments. But it, it is handy to make the piece all at once. And also, when you're trying to get appendages to match, it's much easier to do them one right after the other. You're sort of in a rhythm from the first piece, and you're staying in that rhythm for the next piece. All right, looks like a really good match to me. Nice, excellent. So we've finished our second wing. He's gonna set that into the annealing oven to keep that warm and happy. And I think we've got a, a few more parts to continue to build up here. So 
keeping the wings warm in the oven so later on when he's ready to attach them, they'll be warm and happy. We can get that assembled quickly and easily. Uh, he's pulled out the core of the body again. And I believe we're going to start to build onto that. Looks like we're going to attach a, another handle rod to another spot on the body here. Always something to consider. Where are you going to hold the piece from so you can continue to add the sort of details in there that need to be added? He's got uh, the handle currently at the top of the neck. Well, ultimately, he's got to put the head on there, so he's not going to keep the piece on that handle, or what we often refer to as a punty, P-U-N-T-Y. It's a glassmaker's term for a, a handle, essentially. And as he makes attachments, it's crucial that both pieces of glass are just the right temperature as he touches them together. Uh, if either piece isn't quite hot enough, the glass doesn't flow together properly, and it doesn't make a, a good permanent attachment. The glass will actually fall apart as it cools back down. Now, David judges temperature by watching the glow and the movement of the glass. There's uh, really no sticking a thermometer to things while you're working. So we, we learn to judge temperature and viscosity by, by watching the, the glow of the glass and also just feeling out how it's moving. All right, so he's got that handle attached to sort of the, the base of the tail of the dragon. So now we can remove the, the punty, the handle, from the top of the neck and get this separated. And as he's removing material, you, you might wonder how he removes just the material he needs. Well, he's controlling that by controlling temperature. So by adding the most heat where he needs to remove glass, well, that is going to soften that area the most. So that is the glass that will then be removed. Really all about temperature and timing with this stuff. So adding some other nice details into the neck here. And uh, David doesn't, doesn't have anything too advanced for tools here. Uh, when I picked him up from the airport the other night, he mentioned he didn't really bring any tools. He brought one uh, torch tip, and that was it. And he really just needed uh, some tweezers and a butter knife to be able to pull off a sculpture like this. Love to see that. Uh, we do use all sorts of different types of tools as glass workers, but uh, really boils down to some very simple tools and heat and gravity to, to get the job done with this stuff. All right, so we've got that punty switched. He's finished up the details on sort of the, the chest and the neck area. So we're going to be building legs. OK. Yeah, so we're going for the, the hind legs now. So this is the, the same color that he used for the body. So it'll, it'll all match up pretty well. OK, so the, the temperature ranges that we're working at with this sculpture. Uh, we are not letting the glass really get below 1,000 Fahrenheit. Uh, the torch at its hottest will run up around 4,000 Fahrenheit. The glass never gets up to that temperature, though. The, the glass at its hottest, he maybe gets it up around 2,700. And that's when it's really looking white hot and flowing about as fast as this glass will flow. So that. Ah, so we have a, a question on terminology from the, the internet. All right, excellent. Uh, so there is a, a question, uh, differences between uh, spellings, I guess, of the word punty or pontal. 
so different spellings come from different nationalities. Uh, the American spelling, ponty, P-U-N-T-Y. The French spelling, pontil, P-O-N-T-I-L. Uh, the Italian spelling is ponteo, which I believe is P-O-N-T-E-L-L-O. And uh, what the term ponty stems from is actually the, the French term uh, pontil. So here are a lot of misconceptions about ponty coming from the Italian word ponte, which means bridge, which actually is not the case. The, the Italians don't call a ponte a ponte, they call it a ponteo. So a little bit different there. But yeah, that's, that's the origins of the language. There is no one specific correct way. They, they just happen to be spelled differently in different languages. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, how did David mix the color on these glass rods? So really, all, all he did this morning uh, for his prep work was to take a rod of colored glass, heat up a thicker rod of clear glass, and just draw stripes of that colored glass onto the clear. So that built up a, a larger volume for him to be able to work with. Now, this particular color that I've got in my hand here is uh, very dense, uh, very densely colored with silver and germanium. This combination of colorants with this density will give a broad range of colors. Uh, everything from sort of this orangey amber to a really dense transparent purple. Uh, you'll get some sort of bluish gray tones from it as well. So he's getting a whole variety of, of color effects really just from this one, uh, this one type of color rod. So all, all of his prep was a matter of striping thinner color rods onto a big, thick rod of clear. So we use different types of attachments as glass workers. Uh, you may have noticed as David worked on those little uh, sort of lima bean shaped sections there, uh, he had the piece on a clear glass rod and then just tapped the rod and they fell right off. Well, we can control how well the pieces adhere to one another with temperature. So if we want a, a piece to fuse permanently together, we get both sections to a point where they're almost white hot and touch them together, the glass flows together, but we, we get what we often refer to as a hot seal. So at that point, both pieces of glass are oh, probably over 2,500 Fahrenheit. They flow together, you get a, a good hot seal. But if we have the glass a bit cooler when we touch it together, it will still stick, but it won't fuse permanently. And as you saw with uh, David working here, a little vibration is enough to separate them. So yeah, oftentimes we don't want something attached to a permanent handle. We want to be able to get it off there quickly and cleanly and, and we can control that with temperature. So again, temperature and timing are, are really what this stuff is all about. And my, my recommendation to people trying to do those cold seals is to uh, get pe both pieces just barely glowing a little bit orangey get out of the flame, count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, and touch them together, and you will typically wind up with a good cold seal that'll hold together for a bit, but come apart when you, when you need it to come apart. All right, so looking like uh, sort of the hip area for the hind legs going on here. So again, David's really controlling temperature, making sure that glass is proper temperature to, to really flow together. And the better you control your temperatures as you make these attachments, the less recovery you, you have to make. Uh, I see a, a lot of younger flame workers nowadays who are very reliant on their hand torches. Uh, they, they attach parts, they're a little bit cold when they go together, and then there's a whole bunch of time spent with a hand torch trying to really finish fusing in the, the attachment. 
if you get your temperatures right, the glass flows together cleanly and you don't have to worry so much about going back and, and touching up those attachments. And as you can see, David got that attachment to work perfectly. It flowed right together. He's working the glass nice and hot, attaches in the flame, and it really flows together cleanly. It doesn't take as much recovery of shapes and recovery of temperature. So I guess my suggestion is learn to work hotter. David makes all sorts of different types of dragons, different body positions. And uh, so he, he knows his postures. He, he knows exactly what position he needs each of those legs in. He very quickly uh, got the sort of the core of the body set up with the bends and the, the curves in just the right spots. He knows exactly where he's going with this, uh, this design. And people often like to ask us uh, glass artists if we know exactly what we're going to make before we light the torch. Do we know where all the details to go and what, what everything's going to look like? And uh, yeah, we do. Uh, before David sat down, he knew exactly which dragon he was after, uh, knew exactly which materials he was going to need, how much he needed to prep. And he could make some subtle adjustments as he's working along here, but he has a very distinct vision in his head. He, he knows where he's going with this. All right. Looks like we're starting to dip into the front legs here. So again, really getting temperatures right. So that glass flows together as he touches it. Gets a good hot seal as it goes together. People often are, are surprised when they see a flame worker working with such aggressive flames and the, the details seem to work out just fine. They wonder why some of the other details aren't just melting right off. Well, he's very accurate with where he's placing the heat. Uh, he can get away with some of those spikes on the back of the dragon sort of gliding through the flame quickly. That's not going to be enough heat to really get those moving. As long as he doesn't focus heat on those details, they'll stay just fine and he can simply focus the, the heart of the flame where he really needs to soften the glass. So that's a, a good way to control things here. Good use of gravity right there. He just needed to stretch the material out, get it a little longer and narrower. Gravity is uh, a glass worker's best friend or potentially worst enemy. And really the, the most important tools we have when we work with molten glass are simply heat and gravity. Where the, wherever the glass is hottest, that's where it's going to be the softest. It's always falling down. You learn to work with those principles. So uh, another thing worth noting here is how David works from the core of the body outward. Uh, again, that's controlling temperature. Uh, if he continues to stay in working on the core of the body, he needs to continue to keep that really hot. Uh, if he lets that core cool too much and then tries to add a hot detail to it, it's very likely to crack. Well, he's already added 
the, the details that need to be tightest to the core of the body. So he can continue to work out away from the body, and as long as he doesn't drive too much heat back into the body, he's safe. And it's uh, perfectly safe to work further out on these thinner appendages. They'll, they'll heat in just fine, not nearly as much of a risk of cracking as the, the thicker sections are. So it makes sense to work out from that thicker chunk. Get all the, the details in that thicker spot done, then you can work further away from the body. It's less risky for the, the core of the body that way. There's a, a lot of things in glassworking that seem like common sense. Uh, they're not really all that common until somebody might point them out to you. So as glass is heated, it's sort of swelling or expanding. As it cools, it's contracting or shrinking. So if you get your temperatures too uneven or if you change the temperatures too quickly, things start moving at different rates, expanding and contracting at different rates. They start pushing and pulling, and that's what's going to cause an object to crack. But if you think about the gradient of temperature, uh, moving from hotter area or moving from cooler area with heat sort of dissipating out, you can continue to work in those areas that are further out and, and staying hotter. And as long as you don't heat the, the core that has gotten cooler too quickly, everything stays safe. A lot of people get scared off from larger scale sculpture. And uh, if you really sort of keep those heat principles in mind, working larger isn't such a, a scary thing. It all starts to make more sense that way. And all these attachments, he gets the glass screaming hot, really lets it flow together. Gets a, a nice, consistent, stable attachment just with that initial touch. If you learn to work the glass at those temperatures, you can accomplish a lot. So I just picked up uh, another rod of that sort of bluish green transparent color here. Let's see what this gets applied to. Never had a chance to watch David work all the way through one of these dragons before. We actually uh, collaborated on a piece several years back that was uh, sort of a big fountain form, and David made a, a beautiful dragon to go on the top of it, but I was so busy working on the fountain, I didn't get a chance to watch the dragon as much as I would have liked. So this is a, a nice opportunity. But uh, that said, I don't necessarily know every single move of, of where he's headed to next. So it looks like we've got a claw. Uh, so at this point, the, the core of the body, he's been staying away from there, not applying much heat. So it's probably a little too cool to let that flame hit it. So he's sort of working around that. He's perfectly safe working in those thinner areas that are further off from the body. But uh, at this point, if he really sticks the meat of the flame uh, on the body, it'd be very likely to crack. So he knows exactly what parts he can work on and when and, uh, and how to get away with all of that. And again, this is uh, an object he's made probably hundreds of times. So he, he knows every step pretty precisely where all of those details need to be bent and curved. So for anybody who might uh, just now be tuning in, we'll get you up to speed here. We have uh, a special visiting artist with us here in the Amphitheater Hot Shop at the Corning Museum of Glass. This is David Sandage. 
and uh, he is visiting us from Claremont, Florida. Uh, David is a very skilled flameworking artist. Uh, he has been flameworking for 40 years now, actually. Sorry to keep giving away your age, but he started when he was 15, which is a pretty ripe age to get started in glass. Uh, his brother actually introduced him to the, the craft. Uh, his brother worked for a, a glass company called Glass Baron that had their headquarters in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, when David was brought into that factory, like many of us who have gotten into glass, just was immediately taken by the, the possibilities and the, the excitement of the process. And uh, he has worked glass all around the world. Uh, he was actually recruited away from Glass Baron by uh, a company called Arebus Brothers that has glass shops in all of the, the Disney parks around the world. And uh, so David has worked at all of those different parks all over the world. He's got work all around the world. And uh, he left Disney a, a few years ago and has gone out on his own again as an independent artist. And uh, you are most likely to run into him at different uh, fine art fairs all around Florida and also around the state of Virginia. And he has his own studio right at home. That is one of the nice things about flame working. It's a very accessible form of glass working. It doesn't take a ton of utilities, doesn't take a ton of space. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive, so it's actually a, a great way to get into working with hot glass. All right, this piece is really coming together quickly here. Gotta, yeah, so we've got sort of the, the, the hands and feet. Now we're going to add the, the real claws on the end there. And I always like the way David makes his claws. Uh, one, one of the risks when you're making your claws on a dragon, if you want them really fine and thin and pointy, well, they're really fragile that way. But the way he attaches these onto the toe and sort of pulls off a fine point, but it's not a long fine point, it makes for a very fine detail that's also very structurally sound. And uh, I... I I've made a lot of dragons myself through the years, and I learned to sort of emulate how he does these claws. It's just a very sensible way to go about it. You get that nice detail, but it's also really structurally sound. My favorite flame worker question, by the way. Uh, which black distillation needs the most for sculpting? Aha, uh -huh, another question from the web. Which black does David most like to use for sculpting? says onyx or jet black and this right here is jet black that he's using today so those of you who might not be quite so familiar with our, our different uh, glass suppliers and, and what's available out there in our industry Glass, uh, colored glass is created by adding different metal oxides, different combinations of metal oxides in with a batch of clear glass ingredients. And most artists don't create their own colored glass. Uh, most will simply order colored glasses from different suppliers that manufacture colored glass specifically for artists to use. Uh, and there are all sorts of variations out there. And black is not a true black in glass. Uh, black is a very dense version of either a blue, a purple, a green, or a red. And uh, the jet black that he's using here is a really dense blue. And some of these different blacks work different ways. Some of them are softer, some are stiffer at the same temperature. So uh, there are different preferences for, for different blacks for different purposes. Uh, if you want a, a certain density of black, maybe you're pulling something very thin. So you might want to, for something like that, I might use Eclipse black or a Raven black, which tend to be more dense. So if I pull them very thin, it still holds that, that nice black color. Uh, this jet black 
if I'm sculpting with it, it's really handy. It's very soft, so it flows easily and quickly. Uh, but if I thin it out too much, it looks blue, so that's a, a consideration there. So there, there is a, a lot of color theory to consider as a, a glass artist. And, and any artistic medium, sure, you have to think about uh, color theory. But with glass, we have true transparency and true opacity. And uh, if you don't combine colors properly, you could completely uh, ruin a piece. Or, or you may simply not see the color effect you're actually after. So uh, having a, a good understanding of sort of the, the range of color options that are out there and, and knowing which one is going to be best for your particular application is really handy. All righty. So it looks like he's getting everything laid out just the way he needs it so he can work quickly and smoothly in and out of the annealer. All right, yeah, it's missing missing one part so far, which of course would be the head. So that's our next step here. I uh, get the head prepared, and then uh, I think we get to, to the final stages of assembly. And the the order of process here is really sensible. Uh, as I mentioned, as he was working on the legs and then the claws, he had gotten away from working the body, so the body was cooling. So now he's set it back into an oven that's going to slowly warm back into the body. As he works on the head, by the time he's finished with the head, the body is going to be back up close to 1,075 degrees. He can pull it out of the oven, and then he can go at it aggressively with the flame, and it'll be safe. It won't be likely to crack. So the, the timing of, of each step here just makes sense. This is the most efficient way to go about this object. And uh, if you really want to make a living as a glass maker, you better learn to work efficiently. Uh, working glass is not an inexpensive thing. We use a, a lot of natural resources to fuel the, the flames and also to, to create all the materials. So the more efficiently you can work, uh, the more easily you can stay in business and, and keep your bills paid and keep your price points down to a point where You've got saleable objects at the at the right prices as well. That's why it's also important to know your design before you start diving into something. Now, there are times when we do simply experiment and sort of play with the material, maybe just have a really rough idea in mind and feel our way through it. But uh, when you're really going at it and trying to, to make a living off of a piece, you better know your design, know where you're headed with it, and uh, be able to work it as efficiently as possible. And uh, one thing I'm noticing here, he has very little of his prep material left. Like He knows exactly how much material he needed to prep to pull off this dragon. Uh, he had a, a whole bunch of stuff. Probably took uh, about an hour and a half this morning to, to get everything prepared. And uh, it looks like he had the exact amounts of everything that he needed with just a, a little bit of surplus, just in case something goes wrong. Not that that would ever happen. All right, so this is that same uh, color that he's got for the body and for the legs that silver germanium composition.
right? So just sort of portioning out material and starting to set up the head of our dragon here. And it looks like David's a, a little bit ahead of schedule here. Our live stream is going to go till 4 o'clock. And he mentioned uh, after he finishes the dragon, he might show us uh, an interesting, uh, another interesting technique in glassworking that you tend not to see very much these days. It's uh, known as loop stitching. You used to see a, a lot of that style of glassworking uh, all throughout really the, the 20th century flame working scene. Or I, I've even seen pieces loop stitched from the, the 16th century, so it's been around a long time. You don't see too much of it anymore, so uh, we'll see once David gets the head done if we have uh, and gets everything assembled if we have some time for a, a quick loop stitched piece, but uh, I would certainly recommend staying tuned for that one. So at this point, I don't know the specific order of how he's putting this together, but this is David Sandage here. He is uh, a visiting artist with us, visiting from Florida. And David has been working on a beautiful dragon today. And at the moment, he's working on the dragon's head. The wings and the rest of the body are in the black oven at the end of the room here. So, you all just walked in at a pretty good time. You're, you're going to get to see all the details of the head come together, and then he's going to assemble all the parts, and uh, we'll have a, a finished dragon in maybe uh, 20 minutes or so. So, David's using a, a process known as flame working, one of many different processes we can use to shape glass. Uh, the torch he's using to soften the glass runs on propane and oxygen. Uh, when he cranks it up as high as it can go, we'll get temperatures pretty close to 4,000 Fahrenheit. At the moment, we're a little bit cooler than that, maybe 3,000 to 3,500, still incredibly hot, but not quite maxing out what the torch is capable of. And these torches are great. We can control temperature. We can control the size and the shape of the flame to control sizes and shapes of things we might want to melt. And we can also control the atmosphere of the flame, the, the mixture of oxygen to gas. And that mixture of oxygen to gas can affect different colored glasses that we work with. There are essentially uh, three different types of flames that we might work with. Uh, when we have the, the balance of oxygen to gas such that the oxygen is causing all of the gas to completely combust and all of that oxygen gets used up in combustion. We call that a neutral flame. If we add a little more oxygen to that and wind up with some unused oxygen pushing through the flame, that would be an oxidizing flame. Uh, if we have a little more gas running through the flame, and not enough oxygen to combust all that glass, that would be what we refer to as a reducing flame. And we get some different effects with different colorants uh, with different flame settings. So some different colored glasses really need to be worked in specific flames. Uh, some colored glasses, we're going to actually change the color by working it in different flame atmospheres. So there's a, a lot to know. And, uh, a lot of experience that, that sort of comes together to, to make a, a good piece of advanced glass. And uh, yeah, the, the tools David's working with here are pretty simple. That's a butter knife with 
Doesn't take too much. Butter knife and tweezers, and, and he's ready to go. Uh, the torch is pretty important too, of course, but uh, as far as the, the hand tools for shaping, he's done most of the shaping just by using heat and gravity and the glass itself, pushing, pulling. Now he's about to add the eyes onto the head of the dragon here. He prepared material for the, uh, these eyes so he could make them very finely detailed. And I'm going to show you what he prepared here. I'll come right out to you guys. So to create a whole bunch of eyes with very fine detail to them, we create what's known as a Marini cane. So he sort of built up a sculpture about that long that has that image in the center of it. He heated it up and pulled it. So now we have this whole length. We can just take slices off of this, and we have a whole bunch of these nicely detailed dragon eyes. So he's just going to be attaching slices to the head. So you can see the, the pattern in the center there. Yeah, so it allows us to make a lot of a pattern item in, in one shot. You know what these look like. All right, uh, another question from the web here. Uh, so uh, assuming you have adequate ventilation, how much does sort of this basic setup cost to, to get started in flame working? Uh, well, torches can range in price from, I guess, maybe $75 to several thousand dollars. Uh, the torch that David's working on here, a, a Carlisle CC, I think those are around 1300 bucks brand new nowadays. So that gives you an, an idea. Um, these really have been sort of the industry standard for flame working for several decades now. There are a number of other torch companies out there in the world. Uh, and different torches are built differently. They function differently. Some can work much hotter than others. Some are actually designed not to run incredibly hot. Uh, but this this particular torch is really uh, really works for a variety of tasks. Uh, you can get uh, quite a bit of heat from it. You can really control the the shapes and accuracy of your flame. So this is a, a very common torch. Yeah. So the the torch ranges can go all sorts of different directions. Uh, from there, you need a few basic hand tools: some tweezers, butter knife. Um, if you're like myself and many other glass workers, I know you, you tend to become a, a tool collector because there are so many amazing, beautiful tools that are, are made out there in the industry. But really, to get started, you don't need much more than tweezers and a butter knife. Uh, maybe you want a, a graphite paddle that might cost another 50 bucks or so. Uh, as you continue to grow as an artist, you might start to look into things like uh, crimps of different shapes and different textures. Those might run you anywhere from 50 bucks to 150 bucks, to depending on the, the size and sort of the, the, the quality of materials involved. So there, there's a whole range. Uh, you're probably going to want some graphite plates for your tabletop. Uh, you definitely want a, a fire retardant tabletop. This is just a uh, hardy backer concrete board. Doesn't take a ton of money. You're going to need some regulators for your gases. Those are maybe 100 bucks each, one for your gas or your fuel, so either propane or natural gas. And you'll need one for the oxygen, the accelerant for the flame as well. Uh, you're going to need some gas hosing to be able to connect everything. There's another 50 bucks or so. So hopefully uh, you guys are adding this up as I'm sort of going through the details. So 
but I'll give you some, some idea of what you need. And ultimately, you are going to need an annealing oven as well. Uh, those range in size and quality and therefore range in price quite a bit as well. Uh, anywhere from maybe a couple hundred bucks to a, a few thousand dollars, depending on the, the size of what you need. So yeah, you can, you can get started flame working for maybe $500, have a, a basic setup and be able to get started. So pretty accessible. Uh, if you want to build a even a basic hot shop, furnace, reheating furnaces, things like that, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars for initial investment. And uh, that's just when the expenses start, because as soon as you turn on a furnace, it needs to stay on, and then your utilities are the, the big expense there. And with flame working, I think probably the, the uh, sort of studio material we spend the most money on is oxygen. We go through a, a lot of oxygen and uh, a week's work. That, that tends to be the bigger expense. Colored glass is another fairly uh, large expense as well. Borosilicate colored glass, uh, the, the price range is, is pretty broad. You can maybe find some seconds from a few different companies that you might be able to get for 25 bucks a pound. And some of the, the new colors that are very precisely engineered might cost you up to $160 a pound. And uh, a, a pound of glass rod probably looks about like that. So not, not that much. It, it, uh, it does get pricey. And as David was prepping uh, his color for such a, a large object as this dragon, to be more efficient with the colored glass, he simply striped colored glass over clear glass. So the, the core inside of this entire dragon is clear. You're not going to know that unless you break it open. So the, the surface is fully colored, but the, the core happens to be clear. Just a, a more efficient way to use the glass. And also on the wings, he was using uh, this transparent bluish green. Uh, if you were to build up that much thickness with just that colored glass, the color would get so dense, you wouldn't see the blue very well. It almost looked black. So for the effect he wanted, the, the transparency, it was crucial that he laid that transparent over clear glass to really further dilute it. So There's a, a lot to think about. All right. So we've got our eyes on there. Looks like we're getting some spikes sort of on the snout. Pretty good stuff. We got a couple of the teeth on there. Is that a tongue as well? Ah, uh, chin. Excellent. All right, so switching handles or, or punties. Just getting that clear glass off the end. All right, so an another question from the web, and this is a, this is a tricky one. Wondering difficulty levels. Uh, how much harder is it? Uh, this is somebody who clearly is very familiar with our, our, our glass makers here at the museum. Uh, is it more difficult for George to make one of his massive dragons for a, a dragon stem goblet? Or is it more difficult going a bit smaller for what David's up to? Well, to be honest with you, it's all hard. Uh, it's uh, the, really is no comparison. It, it's sort of apples to oranges. Uh, entirely different processes, different skill sets. It's all difficult. Uh, to do what's da what David's doing, uh, 
it takes every bit of his 40 years of experience to, to make this dragon, this scale, this level of detail. Uh, for George making his massive dragons for dragon stem goblets that are three feet tall, takes every bit of his 30 years of, of glass working experience for that stuff. So it, it's all hard on this level. It's, it's all really difficult. Uh, all right, so just to prove this comment here, uh, asking how much harder it is to, to make one of the enormous dragons that George might make or a slightly smaller dragon on the, the torch here like what David's making. Well, we used to do a lot of cross-training of our, our staff here at the museum. Uh, our flame workers would learn a little bit of furnace work. Our furnace workers would learn a little bit of flame working. And I taught George to make some some pretty small fish on the torch. He picked it up really quickly. He knows glass, picked it up uh, plenty fast, but it wore him out a lot faster than he expected. It used to get his shoulders tired. It's different muscles. It's just, uh, it's a, an entirely different thing. It takes different muscles. You're sort of using a different part of your hand even as you're flame working. Flame working tends to be a little bit more in the fingers, whereas a lot of furnace working tends to be more in the palm of the hand. Uh, you're using different sets of muscles to uh, accomplish this stuff. So it's very different. If uh, I, I could make that fish no problem and feel no soreness in my shoulders, but if George were to hand me one of those dragons on the pipe, I might not even be able to get it off of the bench. So it's, it's just uh, an entirely different thing. All right, so we've got the head attached here. Just getting the, the rest of the, the punty removed from the tip of the snout there. Really getting everything fused in. It, uh, to, to make a dragon in this way, where you're making the parts separately, to, to make the head while the rest of the body is still in the, the annealing oven and you can't even look at it, it's pretty tricky. It's hard to get the proportions right. But uh, David, David nailed this. He, he knows his proportions for these dragons incredibly well. Everything is the right size. It flows together. The, the aesthetic works out really well. Now, the benefit to making things in separate parts is you can focus a little more on those finer details. By just having the head to work on, that's all he has to worry about. If he's building the head while it's on the whole body, that whole body's at risk as he's trying to make these fine details, and he's got to hold that whole heavy object the whole time. So it's a bit easier to get the detail by making it in separate parts, but it's hard to get the aesthetic and the proportions right when you make them in separate parts that way. Aha. So next step here, we're making the ears to go on the dragon's head. And the, again, the, the order of process that he uses here, very sensible. Uh, he could have potentially built the ears right onto the head uh, would have been a little risky as he is attaching it to the neck. He might melt off the, the ears. So making them separately now that the head is attached, it also gives him the advantage that he's soaking heat back into the core of the body right now. So he's making this fine detail that he can attach. Once he gets it attached, the rest of the body has warmed up as well and uh, he may be ready to go right in and, and get the wings attached also. So this whole order of process makes a, a ton of sense, eliminates a lot of the potential risks of making an object like this. I love some of the camera views we're able to pick up in here. Not bad.
Okay, so a another pretty unique question from the web. Uh, someone in a wheelchair wondering how accessible flame working would be. It's a great process uh, if you are uh, if you're confined to a wheelchair. Um, if you're looking to really go large scale, it's going to be a bit more difficult. There are potentially some tools that might be able to really help with that. Uh, if you could afford a glass working lathe and you wanted to go really large scale, that would make that possible. Um, it can be difficult working at the bench large scale if you can't if you're not particularly mobile. Um, you notice David is sort of back and forth to the oven quite a bit to work on this scale. Uh, but you could simply set up your shop so everything's easily within reach. Yeah, so I think uh, flame working is an ideal process if you have uh, some, some mobility issues, absolutely. And if you're just looking to get into it, well, it's gonna be a long time before you're working at this scale anyways, so uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Just Just dive in. Right, getting those ears attached, sort of right around where the seam was, where you attach the, the neck and the head. And the, another really sensible thing that just happened there, I don't know if you noticed, but he made both ears sort of at the same time, right at the end of the same rod. So he could match the proportions. They're both right next to each other, easy to see and easier to match proportions that way. So a lot of, a lot of really... What's that? All right, so now David's preparing the wings to be attached to the, the core of the body. He needs to remove that handle rod, get that out of the way, because where that handle is, that's where it attaches to the body. So we're going to remove the handle. Uh, he's got a, a set of tongs here that are wrapped in uh, Kevlar fibers. So they tolerate the, the temperature really well. So he's gonna set this back into the annealing oven once he gets this uh, punty rod trimmed off. He'll trim off the other punty rod, let that soak again in the annealer. I suspect we'll get the core of the body back out here, set up some of the temperature in there, and, uh, and then we can start to actually attach the wings onto the body. Okay, another question from the web here. Uh, somebody who clearly has watched a bunch of our live streams and seen our, our furnace-style glass blowing. And for furnace-style glass blowing, we often use a big fluffy torch. Uh, and what is sort of the, the difference between what that accomplishes and what David's doing here? We're, we're not really using a, a fluffy flame at all. Well, when we work at the furnace, uh, the glass we use is different than what David's using here, and we're, we're typically making some, some different types of objects. Uh, the glass we use for our furnace work is soda lime glass, which is really uh, prone to cracking with extreme temperature change. So as we're working a piece in and out of our reheating furnaces, uh, we will of often use that big fluffy torch to keep a, a general heat in an area so it doesn't get cold enough to crack. We're not necessarily using that to get things moving a lot, but really just to, to maintain some temperature uh, overall throughout the piece. Now what David's doing here, very different torch, there's oxygen added to this flame. We don't add oxygen to the big fluffy torch with the furnace. By adding the oxygen, we raise the temperature of the flame uh, almost triple. Uh, so the, the big fluffy flame torch, maybe that's getting a little over 1,000 Fahrenheit, maybe up to 1,500. When we mix in a bunch of oxygen, we can accelerate that flame up around 4,000 Fahrenheit. So as David's using this flame, he's mostly trying to get areas really molten and flowing and moving. So different goal with the flame and also a different glass that he's uh, applying it to so we want to heat very specific areas for very specific details with the, the very hot torch he's got here.
but the big fluffy torch that we often use for, for furnace style glass blowing, again, that's for just sort of a general heat, not really getting things moving, but keeping that heat soaked into the glass to keep it safe. Uh, that said, there are some exceptions to those thoughts, but that is sort of the, the general sense of it. Excellent. So just added a whole bunch of heat to the back. We're going to start getting those wings attached now. So you sort of set up the heat in the back right where we want those wings attached. I got your door on the way out. And we'll get these wings attached. So again, very precise heating. And uh, one of the risks here would, of course, be melting off some of the other details as he's trying to really pound the heat in where he needs it to, to make this attachment. Again, we really want the glass to flow together so we get a good, smooth, hot seal. Nice, permanent attachment. He's also thinking about how he needs this positioned. Get our other wing attached here. And I know David typically uh, attaches his dragons to a base of uh, a different material. Uh, I believe he uses a lot of manzanita wood for bases. So I suspect that this piece is going to stay on a bit of that clear punty rod. And then that rod would then uh, be mounted into a, a nice wooden base. Uh, he also has been using some other materials for bases as well. But uh, if you're wondering how this object is going to stand or how it's going to be displayed, uh, that that clear punty rod will give you an idea of the orientation. It stands vertically as he sort of just held it a moment ago. So sort of eyeing out the, the positions of the wings. Wow, that is gorgeous. So I wonder if we can get a nice tight shot of it from above here. Here we go. So if you hold nice and steady there, they're going to bring our cameras where they can. That's, I love the, the composition of this dragon, the, the positioning of the wings, how they sort of frame in the body and frame in the head. It's just a, a beautiful design, very sensible. Just making sure all those attachments are fused in nice and smoothly. All right, so a question about annealing an object like this. Uh, so we're gonna load it into an oven that's holding at a just over 1,050 Fahrenheit right now. 
and uh, it'll it'll come down overnight. I was cooling this over, I guess about a a six hour period should be plenty. Uh, annealing with borosilicate, sort of a, a rough rule for for basics. Now different types of shapes can add a bit more strain that you may want to anneal for a little longer. But we typically will base annealing schedules on thickness, the, the thickest part of the object. And with borosilicate, about five minutes per millimeter of thickness to, to soak, to hold at that 1,050 temperature. And then with an oven like this, we can just shut it off. It's going to come down over the course of about uh, six to eight hours, ease the piece back to room temperature, and it'll be perfectly stable. A beautiful dragon, David Sandage. That was amazing. So we do still have a little bit of time left on the live stream. Uh, we'll let you drink water for a moment here. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a brilliant piece. I can't wait to see that thing come out of the box here. Gorgeous. So yeah, David mentioned that he would show us a little something about loop stitch work which uh, is not something we see very often anymore in, uh, in the flame working world. This is a, a type of glass working that has been popular throughout history. I, I think some of the oldest loop stitched objects I've seen were from the, the 16th or 17th century. Uh, some ships, are, are you gonna, what are you thinking, do a ship? Okay, so this will be uh, similar to some of those objects that have been made for hundreds of years. And uh, it will be a matter of sort of building up mass by looping the glass together and creating little stitches of loops to build up thickness and, and, and overall mass. And uh, this is a, a way to work glass over a, a smaller heat source and be able to make some really large objects by just building them up and building up individual stitches. Now the catch with this type of work, if your, your stitching isn't really accurate and things aren't fused together very cleanly, uh, it can make for a very fragile piece of glass. If you get your stitches just right and everything's really fused well, it actually can make for a very strong piece. So uh, throughout History, of course, there have been all sorts of different skill levels of glass workers trying this sort of a technique. Well, David is uh, one of very few people I know who still makes glass of this style, and he doesn't do it very often anymore, but he's uh, nice enough to share with us today. And he also happens to be brilliant at the process. Uh, when I first started working at, at Disney years ago, one of the things that blew me away when I first walked into some of the shops are these beautiful, huge castles that were sort of reproductions of the, the big castles in the parks. And that was David's work, all loop stitched into these massive castles that are uh, a few feet wide in each direction and a couple feet tall. So he's starting by setting up the base to the ship. So this will be sort of a, a, a foot almost. And you can see, it kind of gets in a rhythm here. He's keeping the glass rod in the flame for the most part, pulling away a little bit to stretch the glass, then feeding it back into itself so it reconnects each loop with the one before it. And he sort of gets in this rhythm of the same amount of heat, same amount of timing, same stretch length, and then recoil back in creating these beautiful loops. And it really, by, by creating glass with this many different lines to it, it uh, really plays with the optics quite a bit. Light really bounces off of all these different surfaces and you get this brilliant, brilliant sparkle to it.
can see, you can build up a decent amount of scale pretty quickly here. Just a, a few rounds of stitches. We've almost got our, our base all set up here. And I personally do a lot of blown vessel work. So if I were to make a, a foot for a goblet, I would make a blown foot. And it probably would take me about the same amount of time to make the same scale foot as uh, what David's doing here via a loop stitch. So different approaches, different sorts of results you can get. And there are also different types of stitches that people have used throughout the years. So this is a loop stitch. Uh, and then there are other ways of creating these sorts of stitches. You might allow the glass just to fall onto itself, which gives you uh, what's referred to as a drop stitch, which David's going to show you uh, a piece of that. So you can see the difference in the, the look of the drop stitch versus the loop stitch, or the running stitch which is on the bird bath that he just showed you there. So you can get some different visual effects by creating the loops in, in sort of different patterns. So again, this is going to be the base for the piece, so checking it on the, the graphite plate here, making sure it's nice and flat. It's going to be a nice stable base. So now he's going to want to start building in the, the other direction. We need some sort of a handle to support the piece from the bottom, so that's what this rod will be. This is our, our new punty. So now it's going to start the, the hull of the ship. Got to see David make a couple of these yesterday. So I'm starting to get a sense of the, the order of process. Unfortunately, I couldn't watch them all the way through each process. <laughs> The loop stitch stuff, it's a, sort of an interesting commentary on how styles change throughout time. Uh, this sort of heavily detailed decorative object was extremely uh, attractive to collectors of a, a certain time period. And it seems like uh, a lot of younger collectors nowadays, their, their tastes are a little bit different. And they're, they're interested in uh, some, some different types of objects. And this style of uh, construction is a really valuable thing to learn. So it's interesting to, to see how tastes change and craft styles change throughout the years. Seems like a lot of collectors uh, prefer a bit more color nowadays. So we saw all that brilliant color work in David's Dragon.
So I know David hadn't done much of this style of work in a long time before coming up here uh, over the last couple of days. And I, I wondered if it was something that he would need to really practice for a while before we asked him to do it in front of the public again. And well, he mentioned it's like riding a bike and uh, he makes that quite clear. It's a very sort of rhythmic thing. And as he gets in the flow with it, the, the stitches just seem to flow. The temperatures are right. From my angle, I can see the stitches kind of flowing together. So he's got the, the hull of the ship all built up. He's kind of filling in, I, I guess, what we would call the, the deck of the ship. Happens pretty quickly. It all comes together quite quickly. Sometimes punties don't hold up quite the way we would hope. We'll see what, what uh, sort of recovery. Yeah, we'll see what sort of recovery we got here. There's a very popular saying in the glass world. It's not what you can make, it's what you can fix. Pretty sure David's fixed all sorts of stuff through the years. Perfect. Yeah, so David already has his strategy of how he's dealing with this. We're going to finish the, the ship itself, and he can make a base after he's finished with the ship and get it attached to that base later. I think one of the, the more important lessons I ever learned in glass is uh, to learn to relax when you think something's gone wrong. It's amazing what you can recover from 
with this material. If you, you simply keep a, a level head about you, think about what the material needs. Typically, it needs some heat to uh, stabilize it again, uniform heat. And if you just sort of don't freak out when that piece hits the table, think about what just happened and, and what sort of steps you can really take to recover, you can accomplish anything. So another, another question from the web here. What diameter rod is best for loop stitching? Seven or eight millimeters. Okay, so David says seven or eight millimeter are his favorites. I would imagine there's a, a balance. You want a rod that's thin enough that it melts at the right pace for your stitching but thick enough that as you're pulling and stretching and creating those loops that they do stay uh, a, a decent enough thickness to be stable. All right, looks like we're getting the center mast on here. It's got that fabulous uh, sort of rope texture by twisting the glass as he was stretching it out there. So some very subtle moves to get some really interesting effects here. And again, controlling temperature is so important here. He's going to be making the, the different ropes by quickly drawing out the glass and attaching to different spots and reattaching in other areas doesn't want to have to go back again to reheat and fix any of these attachments. So it's really important that he gets the temperatures just right on that first touch. Everything really fuses cleanly on that first touch. Takes a great bit of expertise with the material to get each attachment just right, the right temperature, the right time, get things to stretch to the right proportions. So again, creating that sort of rope look. He kind of folded the glass back over itself a little bit, started to twist, and you wind up with that, that cool bit of texture. It's become a, a very common thing in the flame working world where people use all sorts of bridges to attach different elements to a sculpture. So they uh, attach an element, it doesn't quite fuse perfectly, they want to finish fusing it in really well. So we use sort of an extra piece of rod to make that happen, keep the pieces stabilized while you go back in and try to reheat your attachment point. But as you do that, you start to lose different details. Well, the bridging is very important. It's a, definitely a, an important aspect to many types of work. But if you simply get your heat accurate enough with many simpler attachments, you won't have to go back. You won't have to deal with the bridging. Get your temperatures right. Right, getting 
our sails built on here. You notice every once in a while, he sort of swings the, the the mast and those recently added details through just the very end of the flame, just making sure that things stay warm and happy up there. If it does get too cold and he tries to get back in there with the flame again, it may crack. So the, the very end of the flame is quite a bit cooler than where he has that rod right now. So it gives a gentle heat, lets heat soak back into the material where it may have cooled a little bit just keeping the piece safe. And you notice he works in all sorts of different regions of the flame as well. We get different temperatures in different regions. We get a different shape of the flame. Uh, further out in the flame, it's not driving quite as hard. Uh, as you get closer to the torch, you tend to really heat the surface of the glass a lot very quickly. So the surface gets really hot, but the core isn't quite as hot as the surface. If you move a little further out, you don't have quite so much thrust of that flame. It gives a, a more gentle heat on the surface, allows the heat to soak in more uniformly to the object. So it's important to understand how to use all the different regions of the flame. And notice how he sets up his heat for these long poles and bends. Rather than heating just the tip of the rod, he heats a length of it. He wants to stretch it, so he heats uh, a length of it such that it will stretch as he comes out of the flame with it. For different shapes, we want to think about setting up the heat properly to accomplish that shape. If he wants a, a ball shape, he's just going to heat really the tip of the rod. But if he wants to stretch something and, and really elongate and bend it, we need to heat some length. Uh, if we were try to try to stretch out those sort of long bent sail shapes, but just heated the very tip of the rod, he would wind up with a very thick spot where he first does the attachment and everything gets really thin as he pulls away. But by heating the length of rod, he's able to stretch it more uniformly. All right, so now we're building in sail material here. Another spot where temperature is crucial. So everything sticks properly and stretches properly. Gorgeous. Love it. This is a, a different style of sail from what he was making last night. Gorgeous. David's got a very deep repertoire to draw from. It's uh, pretty incredible stuff. So we're also going to have David working with us here at the museum tomorrow. Uh, we will not be live streaming tomorrow, but if you can make it out here, uh, we're going to have him here in the amphitheater hot shop uh, working from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We'll, we'll let him squeeze an hour for lunch in there as well. We're not sure exactly when the lunch break falls. It, it depends on how the, the, the process moves along. But uh, I think tomorrow, David and I are going to collaborate and make a, a dragon stem goblet. So we'll use one of his beautiful dragons, and I'll see if I can make a, a cup, a foot, and a lid to match. And there we go. There is our beautiful ship. We'll let our cameras catch that. And we want to get this into the annealer. We want to make sure it cools slowly and evenly. And another beautiful object by our visiting artist, David Sandish. Outstanding. And you are really good at your timing as well. So we've, uh, we've hit 358, 
nailed it. Uh, for those of you out on uh, the, the World Wide Web there, we greatly appreciate you all joining us. And uh, yeah, another round for David Sandage. We greatly appreciate you, you sharing our, your talents with us.